Welcome everyone. Welcome to the annual Coral Coates Lecture. We want to thank Corinna Coatson for, and her husband, Lee Rosenbaum, who established this annual lecture in 1995. Coatson earned her master's degree in architecture and construction management from Washington University in 1983. She entered the field of construction management and later founded the practice Edifice Complex. Coatson resides in Santa Monica, California with her husband and children. Their daughter, Chiara, graduated from Washington University in 2015. Corona's mother, Joanne Stoloroff Coatson, studied fashion design here as well. An impactful alumna of our school, Corinna serves as a trustee of Washington University, chair of the Los Angeles Regional Cabinet, and a member of the Sam Fox School National Council. I have a short announcement to make before introducing Tony Griffin. We have um, the chat open for anyone who would like to receive AIA credits. If you could put your uh, name and your AIA number um, in the chat box, um, Chandler will make that recording. So it is now my distinct honor to introduce Tony Griffin for this evening's lecture. Tony is a professor in practice of urban planning at Harvard University Graduate School of Design and the founder of Urban Planning and Design for the American City, Urban AC, based in New York. The Just City Lab prioritizes the leading values of inclusion and equity for a community-first approach to planning and design, also confronting social and spatial justice through the creation of the Just City Index to establish meaningful metrics. Through this practice, Tony served as project director for the Long Range Planning Initiative of the Detroit Work Project, and in 2013, completed and released Detroit Future City, a comprehensive citywide framework plan for urban transformation. Griffin received her Bachelor's of Architecture from the University of Notre Dame and a Loeb Fellowship from the GSD. She was previously visiting associate professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning at UC Berkeley and professor of architecture at the City College of New York, where she founded the J. Max Bond Center on Design for the Just City. The center is focused on several design research initiatives, including the Legacy City Design Initiative, exploring innovative design solutions for cities that have lost greater than 20% of their peak population. Outside of academia, Tony was previously the Director of Community Development for the City of Newark, New Jersey, responsible for creating a centralized division of planning and urban design, launching the city's comprehensive master plan and zoning ordinance. In addition, she led the planning for the Washington Nationals Ballpark District, holding the position of Deputy Director for Revitalization Planning and Neighborhood Planning in the DC office. She earlier served as Vice President for Planning and Tourism Development for the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone in New York City and began her career with SOM in Chicago, where she became an associate partner working on architecture and urban design projects in London and Chicago. A member of the Design Oversight Committee for the Brickline Greenway in St. Louis, Tony is also a member of the winning Shoto Greenway competition team originating with Chris Reed of Stoss. Their loop and stitch plan is meant to connect parts of the St. Louis region east to west, and more importantly, one can argue also north to south. Her life's work is emblematic of the goals and values shared in this project to create equitable and inclusive processes and urban spaces. The class that she teaches at the GSD, uh, the gentrification debates, asks what kind of neighborhood change should we be prioritizing? We are so fortunate to benefit from her expertise as we consider upcoming investments in our region. It's a distinct honor and pleasure. And would you please join me in welcoming Tony Griffin. Thank you so much, Heather, for that very uh, robust uh, introduction. Uh, very happy to be back in St. Louis, even though it's virtual. Um, and again, delighted to um, have been given the invitation to join you all this evening. 
Um, so with that in mind, I guess I can share my screen and we can get started. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. I will go full screen here, minimize you all and we'll get going. Um, so I thought what I'd do um, is take you on a little bit of journey uh, that is informed a little bit by my own trajectory of how I have migrated from being an architect practicing in Chicago uh, to becoming an urban designer and ultimately an urban planner, um, working in the private sector at SOM to the public sector and then back into my own practice. Um, all of this is my attempt to find how I can use my design thinking and design skills um, and exercise different agencies that I think designers have um, as we address the built or live environment um, and how we become, I think, um, now more needed in the work that considers not only place, but also people. So as Heather said, I started my career after architecture school um, at Skidmore, Williams and Maryland, Chicago office, where I was working on really large scale urban um, building projects in London and Barcelona, and ultimately in my hometown, Chicago. And I loved being an architect. I wanted to be an architect since the, uh, the age of 14 and had you know, a really solid foundational um, career um, in understanding how buildings are put together, um, how to design as a collaborative and actually how to design across disciplines. Uh, firms like SOM, uh, you're working alongside the structural engineers and the mechanical engineers, technical architects, design architects. Uh, so it was really my first taste at a school of what collaborative design really looked like. However, you know, I, I um, it, at SOM, I started also doing urban um, design and planning work. So I moved to a really different scale. And that's when I actually started working in Chicago. And I think that scale uh, combined with the fact that my client was no longer just uh, the developer, but it was uh, the mayor or the community development organization or the um, financial institutions or community members or all of those combined that I really got excited about the ways in which design affects the city and the shape and form and programming of the city beyond the building. Um, and I was also beginning to pay more attention to why certain parts of the city look the way they did or why they were invested in the way that they were. So as Heather said, I took a break into the Loeb Fellowship at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. And after that, decided to leave SOM and move into the public sector because I was beginning to see that mayors and city planning directors and other agents of the city actually had quite an important role to play of making decisions about what the city looked like and what architects design and build. So, over the course of my public sector career, uh, first starting in DC as deputy planning director and then serving as now Senator Cory Booker's first planning director in Newark, there were over 50 plans over the course of six to, to eight years actually that I got to use my design skills and translate them as um, a, a design public official. Um, but as I said, you know, what drove me to that was beginning to question more about what shapes the city. So just really briefly, I just want to share what some of these considerations are, because I think in a traditional design program, different from perhaps even an urban design or um, urban planning program, um, we're not asked to understand the underlying um, and longitudinal um, effects of how did a site or how did a piece of land come to be? How did a neighborhood come to be? Why am I as an architect being brought into the conversation to imagine a new future for a space in the city? So there's seven sort of um, dynamics or factors that I like to keep in mind 
or that I, you know, really educated myself about during my little fellowship uh, that I understood as critical factors that affect site. So first is industrialization, forwardism, and the great migration. So this is really pointing to shifts in the economy um, have a really heavy hand in shaping the space of cities. So as um, in the industrial age of the United States and globally was growing in the late 19th century, early 20th century, large waves of immigrants from Europe um, came to the United States. And then large waves of African-Americans moved from the Southern states of the United States to the Northern more industrial states. Uh, a lot of this was fueled, for example, by the automobile economy situated in Detroit, but also had components around what we now call the Rust Belt states of the Midwest and the Northeast. And this method of production, which was very tactical and very labor intensive, drove the growth, the, the, the rapid growth of cities, which then changed their form. Um, we needed to build more housing. Um, we were crowding more people into the housing that we had. We were building factories. We were building spaces to make things that were components of what became the automobile sector. Ultimately, this because this growth happened so quickly, um, the way in which it also began to shape the city was through expansion. Um, the inner cities were becoming really congested. The building and housing stocks were beginning to um, outlive their, their, their useful life. They were being really constrained by um, way more population that they were designed to accommodate and were being used in ways that they weren't necessarily designed to use. So the good news is the automobile gives way to different modes of transportation, different modes of production. So we see, you know, by the time we hit the 1940s, 30s, 40s, and 50, a series of federal policies that make it possible for us to build the first highways, um, that make it possible for returning veterans from the wars to have access to financing tools that allow them to buy new homes that allow them to finance their education by going to college. These things give the average American the opportunity to leave the congested city and begin the growth of what we now know of as the suburbs. So the average person working a nine to five in a factory can afford a car, can afford this first down payment for their home, can move their family to the suburbs and have what we often call um, aspects of the American dream. However, this was not the case for everyone. These policies um, and tools that I talked about coming from the federal government, such as federal mortgage loans, um, um, were not for everyone. Uh, in particular, they were not for African-Americans. And in fact, there were a number of both real estate practices, um, um, land sale practices through deed restrictions and blockbusting, um, that explicitly um, restricted African-Americans and other um, ethnic minorities from having access to these tools to the American dream, access to land, access to home. And there are many phases of this that happen through um, earlier acts that are excluding people from those financing um, capital sources to aspects of redlining, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but all the way up to the 2000s when we see the housing bust of the last recession uh, that was exacerbated by a decade worth of predatory lending that was happening in uh, lower income communities of color. So as people are fleeing the city, what we at one point called white flight, uh, because white Americans were afforded access to tools that African Americans weren't. African Americans were left in the decaying city and in fact cities were disinvesting in certain parts of the city. This, dis this disinvestment became so pronounced that the federal government steps in again and creates an additional sort of set of tools and policies known as model cities or urban renewal or empowerment zones or what's called Hope Six, to begin to draw boundaries around 
um, specific decaying and blighted areas of the city and pushing in new types of investment for new types of uses to eliminate the blight. This is also at a time where you'll see at the bottom left, um, Robert F. Kennedy visits um, Bedford Stuyvesant in New York or Bed-Stuy um, and has the idea to think about how instead of the federal government directing the flow of capital and the design of cities, what happens if we create a community organization that could do that? So this is also at a time where we find the birth of the community development corporation movement, which is a way to push resources down to the folks that are actually living and working in the, these communities and begin to give them a different say in the way in which their community is redeveloped over time. Now, a lot of people might say that those earlier acts of urban renewal, which some called urban removal, um, all the way to Hope Six, which dismantled distressed public housing. Uh, Prude Igo in St. Louis is one of the first uh, public housing sites in the country to come down after only 23 years of being in existence. So some people believe that while that um, removal of that blight to make for better environments was good, other people saw it as a play to remove lower income residents from the core of the city to make room for a movement that was now happening where folks from the suburbs wanted to return to the core city. Um, universities were thinking about expansions of their campuses. CEOs were thinking about the benefits of being in the city where there are healthcare resources, cultural resources, natural amenities, sports teams that are anchored um, were, were being used to anchor a, a type of reinvestment and revitalization of downtowns in the city. So it's what I'm explaining is this kind of ebb and flow of how we value different territories in the city, how economies uh, direct that flow and how we as designers respond to those conditions. But all cities and all sort of spaces in our cities have these kind of ebb and flow histories. And it's important as we do this work to understand the trajectory of the spaces that we've inherited. Um, also, it's important to remember that some of the cities that we exist in or some of the cities that we love are um, the result of grand plans. Uh, Paris, and we no longer think about the history of Haussmann, um, redesigning a central uh, Paris to become a world economy, which was also the removal of highly dense, um, deteriorated and blighted housing tenements to make way for the beautiful city that we have today. Some of us remember the history of planning after Hurricane Katrina. And so while it wasn't an economic recovery that we were, were planning for, we were planning out of a natural disaster. Um, and even ways that we think about public investment around things like transit oriented development and how we think about doing infrastructure investments around transit, obviously to help with the ease of moving from place to place, but also as an economic development strategy so that now we begin to think about what is the shape of the city around our land and nodes, or lines and nodes of transit? Lastly, on top of all of this is to remember that there are people involved uh, as cities change, as that change is directed either by the private market or by local or federal or county governments, people are always involved. People are involved in making the decisions, but people are involved in, in living in these places. And so the, the contests between who has rights to the city, who has rights to the neighborhood, who's moving into a neighborhood, who's moving out of the neighborhood. Are they being uh, voluntarily displaced um, or are they choosing uh, uh, to leave? Um, or are they being pressured to leave because of affordability? And author Robert Putnam, researcher Robert Putnam um, reminds us that part of what makes that vulnerable was this erosion of what he calls social capital. Our, our ability and our willingness and our interest to be participants in what happens in our neighborhoods, 
everything from being neighborly and doing things it's as community, but also being civically active in what happens uh, in our neighborhoods um, and making sure that there is actual um, infrastructure uh, and the ability to be a meaningful participant in the way in which your cities change. So as I, you know, got a crash course and really understanding uh, the way in which cities are shaped, um, I was had worked enough to really reflect upon whether the work I had done as an architect, as an urban designer and a planner was making a real meaningful difference in what I was beginning to name as conditions of injustice, not just existing conditions, but I was beginning to value them differently. Um, as I started mapping spatially some of these socioeconomic and civic conditions, I saw that those patterns at this point across the four cities that I had worked in were really the same. So this is maps of Washington DC where we're looking at unemployment, poverty, education, uh, where poorer residents live versus where wealthier residents live. And on the far right, what's known as a racial dot map. So the blue dots are African-American population. The red dots are white population. There's a little bit of orange, which is Latinx, and there's a little bit of green, which is Asian. When you begin to look at the series of these maps, you see that there is a real divide that runs north-south straight through Washington, DC. Um, the black and white maps, the darker the color, the worse the condition for the residents that live there. So when you move back over to the racial dot map, you'll see that the darker tones of unemployment and poverty and education are significantly affecting the African-American population as is where the concentration of poor housing is. So it became undeniable that uh, the stresses and vulnerabilities of the urban condition were significantly affecting people of color and in this case, African-Americans in Washington, DC, which at the time was about 62% African-American, actually, um, um, just shy of uh, DC, which has the largest concentration of African American, I'm sorry, Detroit, which has the largest concentration of African American population at 82%. So, uh, you know, it was important for me not to frame this um, only as a condition of inequity or inequality, but when I understand the history of what shapes cities, it became a, an unjust condition and that it was set up through a series of unjust policies. Um, we wake up every morning to an onslaught of contests and challenges that force us to consider our role and our identities and our multiple identities and how they show up in space. Um, how we can become agents of change or how we are affected by some of these contests. And so as my career has evolved, um, it's been very important for me um, to realize that the work I do as a designer and as a planner must co-mingle and understand these issues simultaneously. And that the work we can do as designers sometimes can really kind of lean into and have a significant effect on these spatial and social conditions. But there are also times where I need to surround myself with other disciplines, um, other stakeholders to be a part of a more complex and integrated and comprehensive problem solving in order for my design interventions and my design thinkings to have a deeper and more sustainable effect on conditions of injustice. So what is justice, this term that I've become more curious about than equity. So there are a lot of different forms when I came to explore this more deeply. So there's an aspect of distributive justice, which means just that. Um, how is there a fairness brought about by how people receive goods or attention, or I like to think of it as the distribution of material goods, like like property, or is there an equitable distribution of parks in your city or transit stops? But it's also about the distribution of rights and decision making. Um, is that equity, is the representation equitably distributed in a just way that is fair? Another form of justice is procedural. And if you were to ask the average person on the street, 
they're likely to describe justice as something related to the criminal justice system. Again, something we're waking up to every day, which is more about, is there a process um, of fairness? Did we play fair? Um, was, were things adjudicated in such a way that there was a fair process that could lead to a fair outcome? There's another form of justice called restorative. And this is recognizing that something was wrong or wronged and we need to repair it or restore it back to a state. How do we put things back the way they were or the way they should be? And then um, researcher Setha Lowe from uh, City University of New York has introduced another form of justice which she calls interactional. And this is the one that's related to how we um, build empathy, respect, and trustworthiness with each other or with different groups in order for there to be more just outcomes. And I, I like to talk about this one because when we're talking about issues of inequality and especially racial inequality, gender inequality, uh, able body inequality, these can be uncomfortable conversations to have with people of difference. And so it's really important that we build this sort of interactional trust and respect and empathy if we are to do the work collectively of getting towards more just outcomes. So I wanna talk about the, the couple of ways by which my work has been leaning towards creating the more just city. So I'll first start uh, with my work in the academy and I'll start with the Just City Lab, which is a research platform that I created first at the City College of New York and then migrated um, back over to Harvard GSD. Um, within the context of thinking about the Just City over now uh, several years, we've come to have a definition within the lab, which is staffed with graduate students, um, as a place where all people and communities, but especially the least not included, have access to the networks and environments that offer opportunities and resources to be productive and prosperous, advancing their social and economic mobility and agency. We also believe that different organizations, different neighborhoods, different cities have different just aspirations. I firmly believe that a just St. Louis is not the same as a just DC or a just Chicago or a just New York or a just Medellin or a just Shanghai. That every city has a unique set of social, political, economic dynamics and histories and narratives such that their aspiration for a just city is likely to be quite different. And I'll share some examples of what I mean by that. So within the Just City Lab that we operate through a number of different frames to produce uh, content, which are all available on our website. First is a series of publications that we've produced over the last several years that look at, for example, uh, cities that have lost over 20% of their population, which are known as legacy cities. We've developed a evaluation framework for determining whether or not there's good public life and urban justice in public plazas. Um, we've researched inclusion in the architecture profession, both in practice and the academy. We've published the Just City Essays, which are these propositions and visions for what justice looks like in 22 different global cities. Um, we have done um, design studios that ask students to interrogate what the notion of a just city might be. And I'll share uh, the design studio we did in St. Louis with you. And we've convened dialogues with practitioners to talk about what does it mean to be more disruptive and bold in the design work that we do. We've also created a catalog of 25 to 30 different case studies of projects working with designers to inquire about the, the methods and the values that were important to them, uh, the conditions of injustice that their project faced and asking them to articulate for us the ways in which their specific design tactics and interventions were designed to address specific values that were aimed to combat the conditions of injustice. We've displayed some of these case studies through two exhibitions that we've held uh, both at the GSD and at New York City's Center for Architecture. And again, the case studies are available on our website. 
Um, we spent a few years creating what is now known as the Just City Index, this language of 50 values intended to be used by everything from organizations to businesses to neighborhoods to communities to city governments um, to think about what does it mean to both evaluate um, the conditions of injustice in your context, but more importantly, what is the aspiration for what is a just context for you in the place that you are. We felt that it, incredibly limited by diversity, equity, and inclusion. And oftentimes in my work, when a client would ask for um, an equitable outcome, um, it was very difficult for them to describe what that meant. Uh, and sometimes our trained definition of equity could look quite different than what folks living and working on the ground might describe it. And so the intent was to give people a broader vocabulary where they could really be quite nuanced in assembling the set of values that were most important to them. And again, this is predicated on their, the premise that different contexts um, have different aspirations for justice. We've created a number of different tools um, for engagement for how you can use the index to have these conversations within your own space of work. Uh, these tools are available also on our website for you to download and use everything from uh, participatory tools that allow you to uh, create and curate your own uh, combination of values to creating manifestos, which walk you through a series of prompts to help you think very critically and specifically about the ways justice can show up in your context. Um, we've had the opportunity to travel um, globally uh, in South Africa, uh, Johannesburg, uh, Cape Town, uh, Pretoria, uh, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, as well as in the United States to work with different partners to do this work around specific places and contexts in those cities. And as we do this, even often uh, at events like this, if we were live, we often do a little crowdsourcing to ask our audiences that we convene or that we speak to, to think about uh, what are the just city values that are important to your city uh, to have. And we have gotten into the habit of collecting the demographics um, of this information, really to prove the point that depending on who's assembled, where you're assembled, the issue of assembly, that the prioritization of values is likely to be quite different. Um, and so it's bearing out the fact that both conditions of injustice are unique and therefore the aspiration for justice would be so as well. So going on to some examples of work, um, this was a design studio we did at the GSD in 2018 called um, 99 Provocations to Disrupt Injustice in St. Louis. Um, we were really fortunate to have the studio be sponsored by the city of St. Louis, um, U.S. Bank Corps, um, Arch to Park. Uh, so we thank them for their great support. Um, we were able to convene with a number of different um, stakeholders and community members, including your very own um, Assistant Chancellor for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, Nicole Hudson, who penned uh, this essay for us. Um, the studio starts with uh, the students in a typical studio of 12 coming to St. Louis uh, and doing actually some research beforehand to identify 99 distinct challenges that the city faced. And they organized themselves into these 18 or 20 different categories ranging from population to youth, to power, to body, to food and identity. Um, here is just an example of a spread of how we began to capture that. Each of these um, problems were data driven and are supported by um, citations data that begins to explain things from millennials live mostly in South St. Louis and not North, uh, that there's hardships for people with disabilities, all the way to um, documenting that the protest culture in St. Louis is not new. There's a long history of that. Uh, and that there's an voting imbalance in terms of the turnout between North and South St. Louis. Students were then, uh, after coming back from St. Louis, used the Just City values to create a manifesto uh, for their aspiration for the city. So in teams of four, students created 
uh, just these two examples. One was an aspiration manifesto, one was an equity manifesto. Um, students were then um, had to design a design disruption for each of the 99 problems. So this actually required students over the course of the studio to develop five, six, or seven different typologies of intervention to address each of the problems that we had. Um, these interventions range from disrupting the places where we live, disrupting systems that limit knowledge, disrupting conventional economies, disrupting the imbalance of capital, disrupting spaces of disregard, disrupting xenophobia, disrupting spaces that segregate, disrupting the neglect of youth, disrupting shelter for all. So the 99 problems are now summarized into those different chapters. I'll share just a couple with you. Uh, this one is a project called Lived Work um, Play and it was designed uh, to disrupt um, both the challenge of uh, downtown losing a lot of its business sector. So there were lots of vacant abandoned office buildings. This student also recognized that there was a reverse commute that people were driving and the majority of workers downtown actually come from the suburbs. And then they go back home at night, leaving the downtown vacant after five o'clock. So this student thought to think about um, recapturing some of the space as like a commuter Airbnb and that so that people who lived in the suburbs could actually live in the building uh, during the week uh, and then go home on the weekend. But then that same Airbnb space could be used for tourists who come to the city to take advantage of the offerings of the downtown. This student was really interested in uh, the sort of notions of root shock, which relates to what are the kind of mental health and trauma that is experienced by people who live in chronically disinvested parts of the city. So this student created a series of spatial interventions, which were like um, uh, therapy talks. And she was particularly interested in youth and their safe routes to spaces. And so the, the armatures are these cartoon characters that a young person can talk to if they're feeling trauma or challenged and they don't have anyone in the home to talk to. And so it creates a way of creating a sense of community and care in the physical landscape. And then these two projects were looking at the spaces of neglect. And so the one on the left is looking at taking the underbelly of some of the elevated highways and activating them um, as spaces um, of activation uh, that was a bridge between North and South. And then Floral Patch is a project looking at the uh, concentrations of vacant land and how they could be planted seasonally to create these fields of color in the space of where occupation was. So finally, uh, in my practice, the way that I try to push this work that I've been able to develop through the research platform is through my practice, Urban American City. Um, the way in which we look at our practice is um, what I try to do is sort of anchor what we do and the types of projects we take on in something I call just urbanism, a disruptive framework of both policies and practices that produce outcomes designed to break down historic structures and systems of oppression, inequality, and access. So for me, that is about being um, uh, re centering restorative justice, being bold and disruptive, uh, centering values in the work, recognizing a kind of cultural competency that we're dealing with diverse populations with diverse narratives and histories. And in fact, we each as designers have multiple identities that we bring to our work, that the work has to be cross-disciplinary, that it has to value grassroots as a legitimate community expertise in the way in which we uh, validate grass tops and technical expertise. Uh, that to be disruptive and restorative requires us to be political and that there must be forms of accountability. So Heather mentioned that I, I had the great fortune to work with the Great Rivers Greenway and many in the community, including WashU partners on what was then called the Chogo Greenway Framework Plan, which is now called the Brick Line. Um, and we had a really robust role. As Heather said, it was a design competition, which were really uh, quite fortunate to win. It was incredibly competitive. 
And what we found as a team to be um, the breakthrough idea for us because Great Rivers Greenway was very clear and straightforward about centering diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, into uh, the way in which the Greenway would be designed, constructed, programmed, and uh, embedded in the community. That is, Heather said, this, this line that would go north-south in our loop and stitch was fundamental to us making that disruption visible by breaking what you all call there locally the Del Mar divide, and that there was this equitable, if you will, distribution of where this system would go. And in doing so, what we were so excited to find is that we were able to connect the other two significant and important historic parks in the city, Fairground and Tower Grove, as well as Forest Park and Arch to Park. And so what has become in the mental map of St. Louis, this North versus South, we felt like the new loop and stitch created this cruciform that begins to erode that. And by doing so, we engage 20 different neighborhoods in the city and connect hundreds of different experiences. So there is a really robust set of uh, drawings and propositions for how the identity of the Greenway would be, have these consistent components throughout, but that then each neighborhood as it adopted and owned part of the Greenway would be able to begin to graph the Greenway into the fabric of these 20 different communities. Now in a typical city, um, aspirations for equity often show up as only two forms, either through contracting and procurement or through community engagement. And, and our practice was really interested to see if, if we could fill in the gap. And through a number of different forms of engagement between steering committees, public meetings, surveys, um, lots of focus groups and work with partners there on the ground, we were able to fill in that gap with 26 different equitable practices that are organized around businesses, jobs, and wealth creation, quality of life in neighborhoods, identity and culture, and civic and community participation. So just to show you a little bit, and the framework plan is also available on the GRG's website, you can see that what we wanted to do for all participants who were going to have some role in implementing and stewarding the Greenway is that there would be ways to realize more equitable outcomes both on and off the Greenway. So aspects environmental leadership, health and wellness and recreation are certainly things that the Greenway can contribute. But we also want to look at the development that's going to happen alongside of that to ensure that we are putting in measures that mitigate against uh, displacement. Um, that we build community development capacity so communities can grow around the Greenway, uh, that we prioritize um, um, community planning uh, in advance of, in some cases, when the Greenway would be built. And so we use the system to be able to, um, with community, have them decide on what the priorities of equitable practice would be community by community. And then this is an example of uh, the ways in which we might uh, devise equitable practices for issues of culture uh, and identity. I last wanna leave you very quickly with a project that I'm working on in Chicago, um, because it is as my current project, a way in which I'm trying to stack a number of these different practices that I've talked about um, for the purpose of community development. So we're working in the neighborhoods um, collectively known as Emerald South, which are surrounding the new Obama Presidential Center located in Jackson Park, which is one of the um, historic Olmstead parks in the city. Um, it is three neighborhoods that surround this park, but really when we think about how economies flow, they really flow at a much larger scale. So we've begun to think about this neighborhood region as the area of focus on the south side. Just like St. Louis and other Midwestern cities, uh, this part of town really hasn't had an economic driver since the steel mills closed in the 80s. So we're beginning to think about ways that we can activate what we call a now economy and a next economy. We've got to do things to activate the economy today and especially coming out of COVID. 
while we're also thinking about what the future economy will be. And so we've created this framework of Emerald South inclusive economy strategy that is centering the notion of community wealth, um, that it's not enough just to build on sites. We have to figure out ways that households and owners of businesses are building generational wealth that allow them to withstand economic shocks, environmental shocks, health pandemic shocks. Um, so we don't have the deep divide that we have between rich and poor. So deepening ownership, um, driving more capital into disinvested neighborhoods, closing spending retail gaps, reinvesting in our blue and green infrastructure, thinking about ways that anchor institutions are in partnership with entrepreneurs and smaller businesses, investing in people through workforce, and then how are we monetizing and leveraging um, our cultural assets and cultural production of which the Brickline Greenway is a great example of in St. Louis. So we're starting one of the early projects that uh, Emerald South has, which is about a, a two-year-old organization, is thinking about ways of addressing uh, what we have is about 200 acres of vacant land between these three neighborhoods. And what's been important to us, and as like many of you sort of sitting at home with COVID and have likely been looking at creative ways to, do, to break up the monotony of your day, I began thinking about the land narratives of the South Side, which you know was the space where Blacks, as I started earlier in my presentation, migrated from the South to the North. They were concentrated and actually segregated into an area of town called the Black Belt, which ultimately became the place of Black entrepreneurship called Black Metropolis. It was like the Harlem of Chicago, um, but still had a number of deeply embedded um, segre segregating and discriminatory land practices, which now is the home of the first African-American president's uh, presidential library. So I began sort of just playing around with and was inspired by different Black artists who created works about Chicago and collaging them over this sort of context a place that had once been a metropolis and then had been mutilated by uh, public and federal policies that disrupted the land that is now having the potential to be reclaimed. So this project Terra Firma is about um, beginning to envision vacant land not as a liability but as an asset. And to think about how we recapture its value to protect against some of the negative consequences that vacant land um, has, uh, speculation, displacement, and cultural erasure are now a fear people have because of the Obama Presidential Center, but also how we are working with existing residents to address the vulnerabilities that they have faced for years and decades, illegal dumping, isolation, low land values, and unmanaged lands. So on the surface, Terra Firma is an initiative that clean, greens, and beautifies uh, these vacant lots. But we're doing this in a way that we're actually training workforces and actually creating new entrepreneurial businesses that can begin to do this type of work, not only in our neighborhood, but in our city broadly. Um, and for example, on the Obama presidential site, there'll be a five acre park um, and we're hoping these businesses can ultimately be contractors to that project, for example. But in addressing this vacant land, we are also addressing issues of walkability. We are helping to increase land value. We are addressing some other environmental considerations around stormwater management. And as we push this project out onto our commercial corridors, for example, we saw even during COVID, tactical urbanism projects on vacant land, activating vacant spaces, saw a 20% increase in retail spending of adjacent businesses. But our long-term goal is to work with the city. Uh, this project is starting on city-owned land. That land can find its way into ownership of local residents, local business owners. So we're lessening their vulnerability to dislocation while allowing them to realize the equity upside of the revaluation of land and thereby building their generational wealth. So the idea is that as a designer, how do we think about the different sort of economic, social, spatial, cultural um, um, interventions that can stack themselves in a place to create the kind of just outcomes that we want. 
So um, a lot of what I just discussed is available on either of our websites, designforthejustcity.org or urbanac.city. Thank you. You're on mute, Heather. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Uh, we can open it up to questions. If we have any questions in the chat, that would be fantastic. We have one in the Q&A. Can you open that up, Tony, or would you like me to read it? Um, you can read them. OK. We'll feel like we'll be in conversation. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so what are the ways that cities, institutions, and organizations should think about long-term incorporating and acting on these approaches to justice in their work. And there's a hi from Liz Kramer. Hi, Liz Kramer. Uh, nice to have you uh, in the room, even though I can't see, see you. Uh, and Liz was my partner uh, at Urban AC doing uh, some of the work we did. So a lot of what you saw um, was literally at her hand and with her uh, intellectual collaboration. So nice to see you. Um, you know, what I'm finding is, and using the Chicago project as an example. And I think a lot of the way in which um, clients find me or we find each other uh, is because I've centered um, the, this question in my work. Um, cities or organizations that are at a place where they really want to kind of drill down and find ways of practicing differently. They've begun to acknowledge um, both the injustice and or inequality or inequity that's in their city or that's facing their particular population and recognizing that it's no longer a sustainable business model um, and that we've got to do things to redress that. And so um, what I often do with clients like this is that we usually start the conversation really unpacking what that means. And the other thing that I think is really critical about that is making sure that we have created a, a table of decision makers that is representative of the larger constituency, you know, of their city or of their neighborhood. So that the, the stakeholder group that's making decisions about the design of the project, as well as the recommendations of the project, reflects those that we are intending to do this work for. And so a lot of how the work has to start is by setting the right conditions uh, in terms of people at the table that can help um, articulate the right set of problems, the right values, which brings us back to the index, uh, and then start to do the work of coming up with strategies and opportunities. And I found in you know, my small portfolio of work, because I tend to work with for a year or two at a time um, uh, that we've been able, I think, to move the needle on some of uh, those aspirations, bringing those different constituents together that all feel like their fingerprints are ultimately on the final deliverable. And therefore they leave the planning process with a sense of ownership and therefore a responsibility to continue implementing long after I'm gone. While we're waiting for another question, um, I'd like to ask you about St. Louis. Uh, you've been working sure. at St. Louis now for a few years. And um, what do you see as our unique opportunities or assets and some of the biggest challenges that we face? Kind of as an insider, you know, having worked in the competition and being part of all of the teamwork um, and uh, the Brickline uh, groups, but also as someone outside of the city, you know, able to, to look at it with a different lens. Yeah. Well, you, you know, there are significant anchor institutions of which you are one. And um, my experience with WashU in particular is, you know, a really deep commitment to the city um, in, in that you have spatially kind of located yourselves in different parts of the city, you have invested in parts of the city. So I think your stewardship and example as an anchor institution is a really strong asset. You've used that with other anchor partners in the city to drive a new economy uh, that, you know, in the span of 15 years or so is really taking root um, in the, the technology innovation space. 
Um, so having, you know, recovering and leaning into your next economy is a real significant asset. And there are still a number of, you know, national global companies that are have their roots in, in, in and founders in St. Louis. So having that, that kind of civic mindedness, I think is a really uh, great uh, asset for you. The challenges, however, are the ways in which that begins to show up for the largest amount of populations in your city, particularly those that have been um, disenfranchised from that growth for decades and done so with intention. And so part of what's really hard about that is the acknowledgement of that and the ways in which you challenge yourself to do things differently to really repair, restore, and move beyond them. And I think oftentimes um, we think it's only a matter of money uh, and money and capital is really important, but sometimes it's also a matter of how can you just sort of change the mental map of what it is you're trying to address um, lean into the discomfort that it causes us because it's a painful history um, and include um, those that are have been affected at the decision-making table who might come up with solutions that are not the status quo mm -hmm. but may be solutions that we may have to start trying in order to push past um, these things that really feel intractable. And so I think this is the time for innovation and to acknowledge that innovation that's happening at the grassroots level has to be legitimized and resourced and given capacity uh, to see if we can get to the other side alongside some of those things that are tried and true and deeply rooted in our research spaces and with our technical competencies. Um, I think this is where we have to make the space uh, to both grow, learn, and perhaps move the needle. Thank you. We, we have a question from a, a student. Um, as students, what is the first steps that we should consider or that we could should be taking in learning about addressing urban injustices as we develop as designers, architects, and planners moving forward? And thank you for the presentation. You're very welcome. Um, and hopefully this presentation shed a little light on that, um, which is anytime you have an opportunity, uh, which is always the fun thing about being in school. There's so many great lecturers and guests that come to your school. Um, if these are curiosities that you're beginning to have, you know, just try to show up, uh, look across the campus, because uh, there are other spaces where similar conversations are ha happening, maybe about particular issues related to urban injustice, but maybe you're being talked about in the public health side. Maybe you're being talked about through artists uh, and with artists. Um, and so find different spaces, even outside of architecture, where conversations about inequality and justice are happening. And while you're in school, it's a great opportunity to do that. When I was a young architect practicing at SOM, where I was not <laughs> working on issues like this at all, um, I found that the ways in which I was um, being coming involved in professional development organizations and volunteering was ways that I was doing it. So um, I became active in my local chapter of National Organization of Minority Architects as well as AIA. Um, I also joined a young adult board of the Chicago Urban League, um, which just exposed me to different young people and young professionals who were wanting to do things in their community. So that's actually um, was one of the first spaces doing that kind of work outside of my firm, which is where I began to sort of understand the city differently, you know, um, think about different issues outside of just architecture, but that ultimately found their way of intersecting, you know, with architecture. Um, and so those kind of creative outlets were really, really important to me um, as I was grooming my sort of early activism, as well as um, feeding my curiosity around trying to understand what was happening around me. Thank you.
Do we have any last questions from the audience? Got one more minute. Well, thank you, Tony. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you here. And I know we're gonna see you um, in, in the coming years as these <laughs> projects unfold. And it's, it's heartening because the work you're doing is so important. Thank you for being here tonight. Well, again, thank you so much for having me. I hope this was useful uh, and good luck with the rest of your semester. Hope we can all be in person again sometime soon. Thank you.